A few years ago, with my colleague Emmanuel Charpentier, I invented a new technology for editing genomes. It's called CRISPR-Cas9. The CRISPR technology allows scientists to make changes to the DNA in cells that could allow us to cure genetic disease. You might be interested to know that the CRISPR technology came about through a basic research project that was aimed at discovering how bacteria fight viral infections. Bacteria have to deal with viruses in their environment, and we can think about a viral infection like a ticking time bomb. A bacterium has only a few minutes to defuse the bomb before it gets destroyed. So many bacteria have in their cells an adaptive immune system called CRISPR that allows them to detect viral DNA and destroy it. Part of the CRISPR system is a protein called Cas9 that's able to seek out and cut and eventually degrade、uh, viral DNA in a specific way. And it was through our research to understand the activity of this protein Cas9 that we realized that we could harness its function as a genetic engineering technology, a way for scientists to delete or insert specific bits of DNA into cells with incredible precision. That would offer opportunities to do things that really haven't been possible in the past. The CRISPR technology has already been used to change the DNA in the cells of mice and monkeys, other organisms as well. Chinese scientists showed recently that they could even use the CRISPR technology to change genes in human embryos. And scientists in Philadelphia showed they could use CRISPR to remove the DNA of an, an integrated HIV virus. From infected human cells, the opportunity to do this kind of genome editing also raises various ethical issues that we have to consider, because this technology can be employed not only in adult cells but also in the embryos of organisms, including our own、uh, species.、And、when viruses infect a cell, they inject their DNA, and in a bacterium, the CRISPR system allows that DNA to be Plucked out of the virus and inserted in little bits into the chromosome, the DNA of the bacterium, and these integrated bits of viral DNA get inserted at a site called CRISPR. CRISPR stands for clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. A big <laughs> mouthful. You can see why we use the acronym CRISPR. It's a mechanism that allows cells to record over time the viruses that they have been exposed to, and importantly, those bits of DNA are passed on to the cell's progeny. So cells are protected from viruses not only in one generation but over many generations of cells. This allows the cells to keep a record of infection, and as my colleague Blake Wiedenheft likes to say. The CRISPR locus is effectively a genetic vaccination card in cells. Once those bits of DNA have been inserted into the bacterial chromosome, the cell then makes a little copy of a molecule called RNA, which is orange in this picture, that is an exact replicate of the viral DNA. RNA is a chemical cousin of DNA, and it allows interaction with DNA molecules that have a matching sequence. So those little bits of RNA from the CRISPR locus associate; they bind to protein called Cas9, which is white in the picture, and form a complex that functions like a sentinel in the cell. It searches through all of the DNA in the cell to find sites that match the sequences. In the bound RNAs, and when those sites are found, as you can see here, the blue molecule is DNA. This complex associates with that DNA and allows the Cas9 cleaver to cut up the viral DNA. Makes a very precise、uh, break. So we can think of the Cas9 RNA sentinel complex like a pair of scissors that can cut DNA. It makes a double-stranded break in the DNA helix. And importantly, this complex is programmable, so it can be programmed to recognize particular DNA sequences and make a break in the DNA at that site. As I'm going to tell you now, we recognize that that activity could be harnessed for genome engineering to allow cells to make a very precise change to the DNA 
at the site where this break was introduced. That's sort of analogous to the way we use a word processing program to fix a typo in a document. The reason we envisioned using the CRISPR system for genome engineering is because cells have the ability to detect broken DNA and repair it. So when a plant or animal cell detects a double-stranded break in its DNA, it can fix that break either by pasting together the ends of the broken DNA with a little tiny change in the sequence at that position, or it can repair the break by integrating a new piece of DNA at the site of the cut. So if we have a way to introduce double-stranded breaks into DNA at precise places, we can trigger cells to repair those breaks by either the disruption or incorporation of new genetic information. Genome engineering is actually not new. It's been in development since the 1970s. We've had technologies for sequencing DNA, for copying DNA, and even for manipulating、uh, DNA. And these technologies were very、uh, promising, but the problem was that they were either inefficient or they were difficult enough to use that most scientists had not adopted them for use in their own laboratories or certainly for any for、uh, many clinical、uh, applications. So the opportunity to take a technology like、uh, CRISPR and utilize it has appeal because of its、uh, relative simplicity. We can think of older、uh, genome engineering technologies as, uh, similar to having to rewire your computer each time you want to run a new piece of software, whereas the CRISPR technology is like software for the genome. We can program it easily using these little bits of RNA. So once a double-stranded break is made in DNA, we can induce repair and thereby. Potentially achieve astounding things like being able to correct mutations that cause sickle cell anemia or cause Huntington's disease. I actually think that the first applications of the CRISPR technology are going to happen in the blood, where it's relatively easier to deliver this tool into cells compared to solid tissues. Right now, a lot of the work that's going on applies to animal models of human disease, such as mice. The technology is being used to make very precise changes that allow us to, to study the way that these、uh, changes in the cell's DNA affect either a tissue or, in this case, an entire organism. Now, in this example, the CRISPR technology was used to disrupt a gene by making a tiny change in the DNA in a gene that is responsible for the black coat color of these mice. Imagine that these white mice. Differ from their pigmented litter mates by just a tiny change at one gene in the entire genome, and they're otherwise completely normal. And when we sequence the DNA from these animals, we find that the change in the DNA has occurred at exactly the place where we induced it using the CRISPR technology. Additional experiments are going on in other animals that are useful for、uh, creating、uh, models for human disease,、uh, such as monkeys. And here we find that we can use these systems to test the application of this technology in particular tissues. For example, figuring out how to deliver the CRISPR tool into cells. We also want to understand better how to control the way that DNA is repaired after it's cut, and also to figure out how to、uh, control and limit any kind of off-target or unintended、uh, effects of using the technology. I think that. We will see a clinical application of this technology, certainly in adults, within the next 10 years. I think that it's likely that we will see、uh, clinical trials and possibly even approved therapies within that time, which is a very exciting、uh, thing to think about. And because of the excitement around this technology, there's a lot of interest in、uh, startup companies that have been、uh, founded to commercialize the CRISPR technology. And lots of venture capitalists that have been investing in these companies. But we have to also consider that the CRISPR technology can be used for things like enhancement. Imagine that we could try to engineer humans that have enhanced properties, such as stronger bones or less susceptibility to cardiovascular disease. Um, or even to have properties that we would consider maybe to be desirable, like a different eye color or 
uh, to be taller, things like that. Um, uh, designer humans, if you will. This raises a number of ethical questions that we have to, to carefully consider. And um, this is why I and my colleagues have called for a global pause in any clinical application of the CRISPR technology in human embryos to give us time to really consider all of the, the various implications of, of doing so. And actually, there's an important precedent for such a pause from the 1970s, when scientists got together to call for a moratorium on the use of molecular cloning until the safety of that technology could be uh, tested carefully and, and uh, validated. So genome-engineered humans are not with us yet, but this is no longer science fiction. Genome-engineered animals and plants are happening right now. And this puts in front of all of us a huge responsibility to consider carefully both the unintended consequences as well as the intended impacts of a scientific breakthrough. Thank you. There are, of course, the therapeutic results of this, but then there are the non-therapeutic ones, and they seem to be the ones gaining traction, particularly in the media. Uh, this is one of the last, uh, latest issues of The Economist. Everything humanity is all about genetic enhancement, it's not about therapeutics, right? of yours, like George Church, for example, at Harvard, they say, yeah, ethical issues basically are just a question of, of safety. We test and test and test again in animals and in labs, and then once we feel it's safe enough, we move on to uh, humans. Uh, and so that's kind of the other school of thought, is uh, we should actually use this opportunity and really go for it. Is there a possible split happening in the, in the science community about this? I mean, are we going to see some people holding back because they have ethical con concerns and some others just going forward because some countries under-regulate or don't regulate at all? Well, I think with any new technology, especially something like this, um, there, there are going to be a variety of viewpoints. And um, I think that's, that's perfectly understandable. I think that in the end, this technology will be used for, for human genome engineering. Um, but I think that to do that without careful consideration and discussion of the risks and, and the, the potential complications would not be responsible. Now, there are a lot of technologies in other fields of science that are developing exponentially, pretty much like, uh, like yours, and thinking about artificial intelligence, about autonomous robots, and so. Uh, no one seems, aside from uh, autonomous warfare robots, nobody has seems to have launched a similar discussion in those, in those fields and calling for a moratorium. Do you think that your discussion may serve as a blueprint for other fields? Well, I think it's hard for scientists to get out of the laboratory, uh, speaking for myself. It's, uh, it's a little bit uncomfortable to do that. But I do think that um, being involved in the genesis of this uh, really puts me and my colleagues in a position of responsibility. And I would say that I, I certainly hope that other technologies will be uh, considered in the same uh, way. Just